Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for those kind words. And I am honored to get to be here. Yesterday, Brother Leslie Ward in, on our campus at OCC told me that he could remember when there was just one small group meeting in Columbus. So there's so much water under the bridge, so many good people have come and gone, who have laid foundations, and good people today building on those foundations. I haven't gotten to preach much in the book I studied. Three years I lived in Indianapolis. I've passed through here often, but have admired the beauty of this great state but especially the beautiful people in whom Jesus lives. And I rejoice in the eldership at this place, sponsoring this school to develop preachers. And I'm glad that you have Brother David, even though he comes from a foreign land, he has <laughs> so much to contribute. And talking about that, I noticed in his study there is a sweatshirt. If you do what's right and pray and read your Bible and go to church, when you die, you go to Texas. <laughs> Someone has put across the bottom of that, you go to West Virginia. <laughs> My wife has a beautiful placard that she got in Dallas. See, we got sand in our shoes when we were three years in Dallas. And she's carried that placard with her back to Washington, D.C. and several places, and still has it now in Oklahoma, as close as it is to Texas. It has two angels on it in heaven flying around. And one says to the other, if we're good, we'll go to Texas. Men and women both here this morning giving you ears. And how many good things we've heard in these two hours. And I say it's an honor to be here because I know these elders through their designated representatives were not without thought in naming the men who would try to lead your thinking. So it's an honor to be here and to be associated with these men of God who have given so many years of service, study and pray every day to try to do a better job. And I appreciate the good prayer that was offered just now. And I solicit your prayers for my work, 68 years old now. And I'm hoping the Lord will use me yet many, many years and may every influence be for good. Now, evangelism. When you look that word up in the dictionary, of course, it comes from a Latin derivation. But gospel preachers are not content with definitions in English dictionaries. One might check the dictionary on baptism. And an English dictionary might say a rite administered by sprinkling, pouring, or immersion. So gospel preachers are never content with that. So evangelism. I'm glad Brother Goldman is teaching in this school the language that the Holy Spirit used. and makes one think of the Lord himself. I am the A and the Z, no. I am the Alpha and the Omega. It was that language the Holy Spirit used. And you and I want to be able to look those words up. And so for every Bible subject, we want to go back to Bible words. Hold fast the form, the type, the pattern, the shape of sound word, health-giving words. 2 Timothy 1.13 So one goes back and looks at this. 
Some of you may not be in Brother Goldman's class yet, but these things can be broken down in simplicity and I hope made graphic. Looks like hinge scratching to some of you, but it breaks down. This is an EU. And this is a N. G E L I B Z O. And what do those characters mean now broken down? The EU means that which is good. Something that's lovable, admirable, commendable. And this, announce it, tell it, proclaim it. So tell something good, you ungalizo. And as such, the word itself has no religious flavor. It could be your mother-in-law telling you she's going to leave home and go back to her own home. Or it could be a letter you get from her. I'm having to cancel my trip to your house. That could be good news. So the word itself has no religious flavor. A birth announcement is you on Luke 1 verse 19, the angel Gabriel used this word. As he stood before an old man who thought he'd never be a father. I am Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God, and am sent to show you, you Angelio, dead tidings, good news, tell him he's going to be a daddy. So as such, it has no connection to the New Testament. But then when you get away from the broad meaning of it, and get down to the gospel of Christ, the good news of Christ, then we are concentrating on evangelism as pertains to him. Now, how does that start? Relationship to Jesus. Moreover, brothers, I make known to you the Evangelion, the gospel of this word, the good news, 1 Corinthians 15. What is that? What's, it, what's wrapped up in it? First, by way of prediction, by way of promise. It had been announced a long, long time ago. Then, Bible scholars use a big word to tell us about the first announcement of the coming Messiah. They, they, they write it out this way. P-R-O-T-E-D-A-N G-E-L-I-U-M That is the jawbreaker. Coach of Angelium. But it breaks down last that protest is first, first, and the same word, good news, good news, the gospel, a good announcement, the first announcement of the good news, Genesis 3.15, I will put enmity between you, the snake and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. And he shall crush a bruise your head. And you will crush a bruise his heel. There is an announcement that's clothed in some obscurity, but it is a ray of hope. Something good is coming. The woman's seed is going to outdo the devil's seed. And so that is the first announcement. Then there are other predictions. We don't have time to go into the New Testament with that, although direct it's not quoted, but it's alluded to. Then Isaiah, the gospel prophet, in the 52nd chapter at verse 7, how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that brings the good news. Well, back there, it was this word. Bosar, Bosar. That's what the Hebrews call good news. 
All right? So Isaiah was using that word, but it's the parallel with this euangelion, the gospel. All right? So how beautiful upon the mountains of the feet of them that bring basar, bring euangelion, bring the gospel, bring good news. And Paul said he was a quotation about the coming Christ, Romans 10, 15. Then in Isaiah 61, verse 1, sacred ground especially, for it's one of those passages that our Lord himself stood and read in the synagogue in Luke 4. Behold, the Spirit of the Lord come upon me, anointed me, to you on Galeon, to preach the gospel to the afflicted. So these are predictive utterances in the long, long ago of the coming gospel, Christ's gospel, and all things connected with it. So then when you leave the predictive side of it and come to the New Testament picture, there you see John the Immerser. Luke 3.18 uses this word in regard to his work. His work was an announcement of good news. For this was the man who announced to the people an immersion of a change of mind, an immersion of repentance, saying to the people that you believe in him that you come after him, but it's on Jesus, Acts 19, 4. So John was saying, Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. For this purpose, John 1, 29, for this purpose, verse 33, came I immersing in water to make him manifest, to let people see Jesus. And so he was announcing the good news. Oh, I would go then from prediction to the forerunner, and then to Jesus himself. He announced it. Nay, not in completion in his personal ministry. Wasn't supposed to, but yet looking forward to it. And so you read Mark 1 verse 15, the time is fulfilled. God's kingdom is at hand. Change your mind and trust in the good news. Or repent and believe the gospel, the good news. And thus he went about for the three years. Matthew 4 verse 23. He went about teaching and preaching the good news of the kingdom, healing people. All right. So there we see it then in prediction, we see it in John, and we see it in Jesus' personal ministry. But then according to God's plan, he wasn't to stay that way. He knew he should leave this earth. And so gradually he got ready to turn over evangelism to that special group of twelve. So first then to Peter, Matthew 16, 19. I will give to you the keys of the kingdom. And whatever you make binding on the earth, I will have made binding in heaven. Whatever you release on the earth will have been released. Yes, before Peter on the day of Pentecost would open his mouth, the things he said were already bound and loosed in heaven above and came down then through his mouth. So it was going to be turned over. And then Matthew 18, 18, same thing in the plural, not just to Peter only, but to all of them. And then Matthew 19, 28, in the regeneration, the time of the washing of the new birth, Titus 3, 5, from the day of Pentecost, the end of the world, in the regeneration, when the son of man shall sit upon the throne of his glory, when from the day of Pentecost, the last enemy is destroyed, in the time of the regeneration, when ye shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel, spiritual Israel, thus these apostles were being given from the day of Pentecost onward the responsibility of evangelism. Then, without taking the time to read Matthew 28 on this, the way Evangelion comes up again, especially in Mark 16, 15, go ye into all the creation, all the world. Announce the good news. Preach the gospel to every creature. He who trusts 
and is immersed shall be delivered but he that does not believe does not trust shall be condemned and so it was being laid out piece by piece but tarry wait until the power comes upon you Oh, my and so the apostles then on the day of Pentecost began their responsibility of evangelism. And up before thousands of people, and Peter standing up with the eleven and so on. And then Acts 5, 28, you fill Jerusalem with your doctrine. Yes, evangelizing. In Acts 5, 42, and daily in the temple and in every house, they cease not to teach and to preach that Jesus is the Christ. And so it was in the hands of the apostles, but it didn't stop there. They're not here now. Then it was turned over to Christians, all of them. And let's think about that aspect of it. In Acts 2.42, those who had accepted Christ continued in the apostles' doctrine. And of course, that essentially was the apostles' doctrine to tell the story of Jesus with all that it means. I determined to know nothing among you, said Jesus Christ, and him crucified, 1 Corinthians 2, 2. But you read through the Corinthian correspondence and see how many things are interrelated with the good news. You cannot just leave everything else but the cross unless you know what the cross means. And it's all the New Testament is brought into it. But to go on then with it, now the uh, responsibility of evangelism was put over in the hands of the disciples. Then you read Acts 8, verse 4. After the persecution had arisen, the apostles still yet in Jerusalem, scattered abroad, then they that were scattered abroad went everywhere evangelizing. My mother's Bible, which I still love and still the most precious to me, the King James, says preaching the word. They went everywhere preaching the word. Well, it's this word, you angelizo. There's the authority for women preachers. But they were not up before men in a public way. They had been ashamed to do that. They knew that was not woman's province to be a leader. But a woman's beautiful province is to tell everyone she can the good news. Tell them the good news. And thus the disciples, both men and women, went everywhere evangelizing, telling the good news. Well, a whole lot could be said about that, but to go on. I come next to 2 Timothy 2, verse 2. And the things thou said of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who should be able to teach others also. That's where we come in. Brother George de Hoff will remember Pete Hardeman. Brother Hardeman used to teach us this. Boys, yours is not the great commission of Matthew 28, 18 to 20 and Mark 16. That was the apostles. Your commission is 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. That's where we come in. It's been handed down to us to pass on to others. And the things thou hast learned of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. That's our commission handed down to us. So that's the first part of the lesson this morning. And from one standpoint, that takes it all in. But since there are abuses and corruptions of evangelism, I wouldn't do right by you, and I'd be a miss my duty, were I not to point out what I believe to be some abuses of evangelism. And if I forget not, I thought about ten of these that I'd like to mention to you briefly. One is the Mormon abuse of, Roman, of Revelation 14, 6. That I saw in the midst of the heaven an angel preaching the everlasting gospel, carrying out the good news. And you know the Mormon perversion of it. That an angel by the name of Maroney in Fayette County, New York State, went into the bedroom of Joseph Smith and told him where to find the place. He talked so low 
that they didn't awake the parents in the same house with Joseph, he said. But the angel Maronian had come for that purpose. Well, if that's what Revelation 14, 6 is talking about, we get the Bible into a lot of trouble. For remember in other places, angels are not allowed to preach directly. We have this treasure in earthen vessels, segment in 4, 7. And the angel, in talking to Cornelius, did not tell him what they to be saved, but sent him to an earthen vessel. But to go on with it there, if the angel Manoni, an imaginary angel, if he did come to preach the everlasting gospel, if the Book of Mormon is it, that angel wasn't faithful to his trust. For the gospel is age lasting, the whole Christian age. It cannot be changed. And what was given in the first century has to be given now. So if he gave something different, the Book of Mormon, then he wasn't faithful to his trust. For back in the first century, a great evangelist said, as everybody here can quote, Galatians 1, I marvel that you're so soon removed from him who called you into the grace of Christ into another gospel, another good news, which is not another, but there'd be some that trouble you and would twist, pervert, put in racks, would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we are an angel from heaven, were to preach unto you any other gospel, Enough said about Monroney. If he did come, he had to preach the same gospel that Paul preached. And no, anything else would be a twisting of it. So that's the first thing of these ten things. But more could be said about that. Second, here in Ohio, in 1849, down Cincinnati, Alexander Camel was elected the first president of the American Missionary Society. Out of good zeal, yes. Moreover, brothers, we bear them record. They have a zeal for God. But it wasn't according to knowledge. To get the thought from Romans 10, but to apply it in 1849 at Cincinnati. And I'm thankful that you folks know that the evangelism of the New Testament now handed over to the disciples is in the church. 1 Timothy 3.15, the pillar and the ground of the truth. The church is God's missionary society. And you have the examples, as Brother Wendell pointed out, are they going out from the church at Antioch, Acts 13? Are they coming back to the church at Antioch, Acts 14, and making their report? Yes, the church was the evangelistic center. The church is the pillar and the ground of the truth. And there are many, many abuses that have come into the mission, but I won't go into that. But simply trying to see this morning the difference right and wrong in these ten areas to which I'm calling your attention. Third, into literature doctrine from sincere people, knowing that men had abused the gospel and evangelism by creed books, went to the other extreme and said, we'll use no uninspired literature, well-meaning brethren, but so uninformed. But they couldn't even use my mother's Bible in the editions that I've seen. For they all take you back to B.C. 4004, which is not a bad date, by the way. But I'm not going into that at the present. As I mentioned before, I'm so thankful for the work of Wayne Jackson in taking us back how old this earth. He's done more on that than anybody I know of. But that's not a bad date, but it's uninspired literature. In, to put that in the margin of Genesis 1. It's uninspired literature. And these brethren use that. So they're they don't know that they're inconsistent. They mean well. But 
that holds the gospel back, evangelism back, if you refuse to use lesson leaves and quarterlies and blackboards and anything else you can in evangelizing the tongues of the good news. So that is an item number three. Needs to be eliminated. Gradually is being done, but we need to teach people about it. Then, anti-class. Well-meaning brethren have objected to the classes. Not realizing it, for example, Acts 18, 8. Three people sat in a Bible class. A husband, a wife, and a preacher who was off base. And I can't believe a wife could sit in that situation and be quiet. Or a man either. No, they both did it. Aquila and Priscilla. And I believe it's four times in the New Testament her name appears first. And it wasn't because she was the head of the house. But the, the point about it right now is there was a Bible class. Straightened out a preacher. And well, that class was held in somebody's private home or in a Bible classroom. And whether it was done on Sunday morning or some other time, it's still just evangelizing. So these good brethren have failed to see the principle. Brother Wendell's trying to get us to see what's essential and what's not. And so the anti-class movement, I'm glad it's shriveling up. But good people in it, pray for them and be gentle with them. Brother Lanier was able to bring one who, with whom he debated out of that situation. That doesn't happen often. But that's what we need to do. Then, anti-cooperation holds back evangelism. And that's still with us, much more than the anti-literature and the anti-class. Anti-cooperation. Well, what's right and wrong about that? Well, I believe that the present situation at Abilene with the herald of truth is not under our wise eldership. Keeping Lynn Anderson and the false teaching that he has done. But, after saying that, the principle of one church helping another church evangelize cannot be gainsaid. And we must not surrender the great principle of cooperation because some things are not right. Acts 11, 22. When it was... The the news was brought to the church of Jerusalem that a baby church had been started, new congregation, Antioch. What did the folks of Jerusalem say? Each church autonomous. Don't run the affairs of anybody else. Well, of course, that's a great principle, but that wasn't on their minds. That's not the big thing. That could be, but it wasn't. When tidings of these things came to the ears of the church at Jerusalem, they sent forth Barnabas that he should go forth as far as Antioch. Who when he was come and saw the grace of God was glad and exhorted them that with purpose of heart they would cleave to the Lord. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and much people was added to the Lord. What is evangelism? Much people was added to the Lord. Wait a minute, what do we have? One church helping another church in evangelism. That simple principle. Well, Brother Wendell's trying to get us to study it through. What's the sin? What not? One church helping. Nobody taking over? No. But one church helping another church in evangelism. So, the idea of anti cooperation is a diabolical doctrine that holds back the kingdom and defeats evangelism. Then, a doctrine that we heard considerably a few years ago. Leroy Garrett and others, before he switched over, you can't be a located evangelist. Well, for the simplicity of it, 
As I exhorted thee to abide still in Ephesus, 1 Timothy 1, 3. Abide, that's locate. Abide still in Ephesus when I was going into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some not to teach a different doctrine. Preach to church members. Preach to church members. But this fallacy and this error that holds back in remembrance of these things, Thou will be a good minister of Jesus Christ. So in fulfilling the work of an evangelist, 2 Timothy 4, he was to help the brothers also. So that idea of no located evangelist is something else that held churches back. And churches that follow that doctrine shrivel up. They don't make good progress. The proof of the pudding. But then another... That an evangelist is in charge of a church before elders are appointed. And that's still believed in some places. But to get to it very briefly, Titus 1 verse 5. Paul said he left Titus on the island of Crete that he might sit in order the things that are wanting and ordain elders in every city. These brethren have failed to see that they were ordained there simply to appoint it's not to pick out. It's not to select. It's a different word. If we had time, Brother Goldman, to go back to the Greek on Acts 6, verse 3. Choose you. Let the church do the choosing, not the evangelist. Let the church do the choosing, and then we will appoint or ordain to that work. So that's the New Testament pattern. It's not that the preacher was in charge. But they misused Titus 2.15 in that regard. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Yes, God's preachers ought to do it with authority, the authority of God's word. And Titus on the island of Crete was to preach with all authority those three chapters of Titus. But nowhere in those three chapters was he to set in order over the churches. No, that's the fallacy. And so it's a fallacy to teach that a located preacher is in charge of the churches or an evangelist in charge of the church until the elders are appointed. Then, I believe that's seven. There are three more that I want to be for to mention, but I need more time on it, but we won't get to. Next, super, no, that's all right, super evangelism. Super evangelism, high powered evangelism. And this is a live issue, and we need to teach people about it and to work against it. When I was a lad, preaching in Indianapolis three years, 1934 to 36, trying to stir up the brothers to do more, I could never have believed it if you would have told me. The time would come when you'd have to say, you go, some people are doing too much. Overdoing it. What? Unbelievable. It's come to that. And I have across the bear my own family in that regard. Fourteen-year-old granddaughter. It was my privilege to baptize her when she was twelve, though she lived another congregation 12 miles away but so you know I was happy to do that she's grown since that she's taken part in the Bible study now an open Bible study learning how to do it she's overdoing it though she goes to church building five nights a week and this developed her grades began to fall at school and her daddy told her on one Friday night, you've been to church building Monday night, Tuesday night, as well as Wednesday and Thursday. You stay home tonight. No, no. I must not put my daddy ahead of the Lord. She went on. She'd been taught that by a young preacher. This high-powered evangelism. She went on. And then about 10 o'clock, Her daddy called my wife, told what had happened. 
And my wife got on the phone and called that young preacher. And they had quite a debate on the telephone. And he said, it's all right, big gracious stuff, if you do it for Jesus. And she says, she, she, I'm not objecting to her doing lots of church work, but she's overdoing it. She's neglecting other things. He says, do you mean to say you can do too much church work? She says, that's what, exactly what I'm saying. You can't do too much for Jesus, but you can do too much church work. But doing something for Jesus means to honor your parents and do your homework and be a good person in that way. Be a balanced Christian. Well, she didn't get a point over. And that young preacher told the crying granddaughter, you go home with me if you're afraid to go home to your daddy. So he took her to his house with his wife. And then the crying granddaughter called grandma. And she says, you go back home and do it tonight. She called young preacher the phone, you take that daughter back to her daddy, her mother. Well, that's, that young preacher means well. He's just overdoing something. Then, they're teaching young people this. Every waking hour should be spent in evangelism, knocking on doors. Every waking hour they use. So in one congregation, they have Tuesday night visitation. And this brother went every Tuesday night. On Monday night, he was going to a bowling league. Somebody heard about went to him. You're sinning unless you go there to convert people. You ought to be out knocking doors. Jesus says, Come ye yourselves apart and rest a while. Mark 6.31 Be a balanced person. Don't overdo things. Super evangelism for the want of a better word. But it's doing more harm than good in that, in that, in that way. Then number eight. Give your witness for Jesus. Share your faith. Those two phrases, clauses, non-biblical, but they're influencing people, being used. Where'd they come from? Denominations, not the New Testament. Well, now, is it right to bear witness? Oh, yes, directly, of course. Only the apostles were witnesses. But in another sense, you can be a witness in this sense, in this sense it's right. It's another thought about doing to an extreme. Mark 5, verse 19. Go home to your friends and tell them what Jesus has done for you. Beautiful statement. And you ought to be willing to do that. And that's witnessing. And Paul witnessed about his own conversion. He told what the Lord had done for him, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious. But I obtained mercy because of his ignorant unbelief. First Timothy 1. And thus, witnessing both to the small and to the great. Acts 26, verse 22. So it's right to do it. But wait, wait. That's not saying enough. If all you do in conversion... And talking to people of evangelism is to tell them what Jesus has done for you. You never will get to the cross. You've left the sinner out of it. This same Apostle Paul, who was not averse to telling about his conversion, didn't stop there. I determined to not that come when you say Jesus him crucified. Verse 22, 2. God forbid that I should glory. Galatians 6, 14. Not in my own conversion. Not what he's done for me. But in the cross. Then look at it this way. Brother Wendell referred to 1 Timothy 5.10 this morning. This is what it doesn't say. A widow, well reported of of good works, if she's knocked on doors. Now I'm not minimizing that. And if you haven't done some of it, you've got to have a mighty good excuse for the Lord who condemn you. 
But well report off of good works if she have brought up children, large strangers, washed the saints' feet, relieved the afflicted, and knocked on doors. No, I just not there. And it wasn't because it's not important. But it's being a balanced person. A balanced person. I will therefore that the younger women be door knockers. And if necessary, neglect their children, for the Lord comes ahead of your children. And one woman has lost her husband and her children because she's done so much church work. He's not a Christian. He doesn't understand it. He's divorced her now. And she thinks she's a martyr. But she caused it by leaving her children and leaving her husband too much. She was not a good wife. It's a sin to be super evangelistic. It's overdoing it. So I will the fool that the younger women marry. No, that's out of fashion. Just shack up if need be. I will the fool the younger women marry bad children. No, no, not be a second rate woman. Second motherhood, second rate. I will the fool that the younger women marry bad children and then knock on doors. No! God the house. Be a good mother. Be a good wife. There's the balance of the New Testament. The balancing of it. But, let's see, that's one more. If I have forgotten my outline, one more, I believe, and I'm through. Catechumen. Refusing to baptize people until you have indoctrinated them in a catechumen. To tell them how much it means to be consecrated to Jesus. Total commitment. And hold them up until you can do that. Or to talk to those that were baptized years ago. And to point out to them you're not totally committed. Therefore you need to be baptized and start out again. That idea of catechumen is against Bible evangelism. Day of Pentecost, 3,000 responded. They were not put in a room and interrogated how much they knew. And the pagan jailer, who didn't have an Old Testament even, one hour learned enough to become a Christian. And when Paul went back and visited new converts, he did not go back to rebaptize them. But Acts 14, 22, to confirm them, solidify them in the faith, and to exhort them to be faithful. Now, of course, anything can be overdone. That's isn't some of these well-meaning people have seen examples of people that are really not converted and their baptism was just getting wet. And we all agree such as that's a farce. But the idea of saying we will hold up your baptism until you know so much is not New Testament evangelism. So I'll stop there.